This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. As Africa's coronavirus cases rise, countries are ramping up containment efforts while others are easing restrictions. Limited government spending hampers growth in Africa's healthcare sector. And Burundi's political parties start campaigns for next month's presidential elections. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to you live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivier. For more stories that are going to be making headlines in the world of business, here is Uche. Thank you, Hannah. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Biz. U.S. Chamber of Commerce proposes a tariff-free trade deal with Kenya. And Egypt's central bank eases restrictions on cash withdrawals. Of course, all that are coming up within the program. For now, it is back to you, Hannah. Thank you, Uche. Well, we begin here in Africa, where the number of coronavirus cases have been gradually rising. The continent has recorded more than 32,000 cases with nearly 10,000 recoveries. Over 1,400 people have succumbed to the disease. Egypt and South Africa have the highest number of recorded infections on the continent. They have surpassed 4,500 cases each. Meanwhile, some countries in Africa are easing restrictions. Kenya is the latest country to ease measures, even as it confirmed eight new cases on Monday. Restaurants and eateries will now be reopened under strict guidelines to limit the number of customers and promote social distancing. South Africa plans to lift its lockdown at the beginning of May. It is also considering introducing flexible restrictions around economic activity. In Nigeria, there has been a sharp rise in deaths in the city of Kano. Last week, the Daily Trust local newspaper reported 150 deaths. But after preliminary medical investigation, the state government says the deaths were caused by complications from other health conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, meningitis and acute malaria and were not caused by the new coronavirus. Kano State has become the epicenter of the pandemic in northern Nigeria. The region has 77 confirmed COVID-19 cases. More than 200 Cuban health workers have landed in South Africa. They are the latest of more than 20 medical brigades Cuba has sent worldwide to combat the coronavirus pandemic. South Africa is one of the countries on the continent with the highest number of infections with over 4,000 cases. Cuba is renowned for its focus on prevention, community-orientated primary health care and preparedness to fight epidemics. The administration of U.S. President Donald Trump has urged nations to not accept Cuba's assistance on charges that it exploits workers. Havana has denied this. The calls have largely gone unheeded as overwhelmed health care systems have welcomed the help. These men and women are to work alongside South African health professionals in our response to COVID-19. Your mission in South Africa will be complex. It will be difficult. Every day you will have to fight an invisible, powerful and destructive enemy. You will have to do without the company of your family, without the company of your friends, Yola, and you will be possible? far from your home. We are In sure that ear. you are very well prepared to overcome any difficulties. Coronavirus infections remain on the rise in Somalia, forcing many to change their lifestyles. The country has recorded more than 400 cases. CDTN's Belizis Bello has more now from Mogadishu. Mohamed Kahir is restocking his home supplies at this recently opened self-service shop in Mogadishu. For close to a month, the 29-year-old freelance journalist has been working from home as coronavirus infections continue to rise in the country. I stocked uh, up my uh, products, uh, the cleaning products for a month because there is a rush uh, among the people living in the city. So in the next one month, uh, I have uh, taken all the products I needed back from home. Uh, that's the reason today I'm here. Mohammed wears a face mask whenever he's outdoors as a precaution, limiting his movement in the city and only coming out to purchase essential items. But it's business as usual for majority of the shoppers here. 
with most of them not adhering to wearing face masks in public places. Especially in this holy month of Ramadan, where a lot of people are staying at home. Uh, and uh, I respect that because uh, it's uh, a health precaution. It's, uh, sa it's saving a lot of lives. There are precautions that should be taken uh, to, uh, to stop the, the spread of this virus by the Ministry of Health, including the face mask. I have it here, you can see. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, this uh, coronavirus will, issue will, 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 will end as soon as possible. Demand for face masks and other hygiene products remains on the rise in Mogadishu, the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in Somalia. And with the majority of the residents implementing the stay-at-home directive by the Ministry of Health during the month of Ramadan, it's up to stores like these to increase their supplies to meet the city's increasing needs. We opened our doors less than a week ago. Unfortunately, it coincided with Ramadan and a global pandemic. We have stocked up our stores with basic stuffs to address the need of our people. And we remain open until past curfew hours. It's important to follow guidelines of the Ministry of Health and the World Health Organization. The country has one of the highest death tolls from COVID-19. Its infection rates remain one of the highest in the Horn of Africa after Djibouti that has surpassed the 1,000 mark. Hospitals are overwhelmed with concerns that cases are underreported. A few testing centers remain operational, ruling out the possibility of mass testing that experts say will give a rough estimate of the severity of the disease among the public. Abdul Aziz Bilal, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. In Kenya, several companies are trying to respond to the current changes in the business environment. Some are now making face masks for sale. David Odoyo works at a clothing factory in Kenya. His daily routine involves teaching school uniforms. His company has received no orders since the Kenyan government ordered the closure of schools. It was part of measures to help contain the spread of the coronavirus in the country. I have two kids and uh, my wife so plus me, so we are four. So life has been becoming very difficult. This type of disease has bring many challenges to many families. His employer is now trying to adapt to the current business environment by producing masks for sale. The government of Kenya has made wearing of masks in public places mandatory. This has spurred the local demand for the protective gear in the country. So instead we had to change to masks so that my people can survive and take something home at least for their children. We make on a daily basis about 15,000 reusable cloth masks and we make about 25,000 uh, surgical masks. Several other companies have also adapted to survive and potentially thrive during this pandemic. We have seen a number of manufacturers retooling and getting into new areas of manufacturing to meet the growing demands and needs in the market. We have over 30 say, people now doing face masks, both cloth and the surgical ones. The list keeps increasing as members see that as an opportunity to invest in. But with a partial lockdown in place, it means movement is restricted. Because now we have a lockdown, a lot of laborers are stuck in their villages. We are working with the current people we have. We currently have 150 people and we have a capacity of 350 people. I cannot get general workers to come in on a casual basis because they have to be trained to run these machines. For now, this situation is unlikely to change. Last week, the government of Kenya extended the lockdown. Taking action now will be crucial for businesses. Chom Rono, CGTN. In Zimbabwe, 31 cases of COVID-19 have been recorded so far, including four deaths. While there have been some recoveries from COVID-19, CGTN's Cham Gona reports on how former patients who have fully recovered from the disease are facing stigma from their communities. Saul Sakudia was among the first people in Zimbabwe to test positive for the new coronavirus. This was after he traveled to Dubai to buy supplies for his electronic shop. Upon arriving in hospital, he was not immediately attended to. There was a stigma. Uh, from the nurses because uh, I think they didn't know, they had no information, enough information about this 
disease since it's, it's new and they had no protecting clothing so uh, they ran away. Several variety of PPEs which are still in scarce supply involving face masks, uh, all the recommended ones, Google's, gowns, face shields. But I also want to understand that um, <clears throat> it's, it's being allocated, um, you know, with regards to, to the amount of exposure or to, to, to where you really work at. Now, for example, there are some more high risk uh, workers who actually are the first end workers, whilst others are not high risk workers. So it's being rationed. There's ration used, ration use of uh, protective personal equipment. Uh, so that we we use it uh, effectively. Sakodia's symptoms were relatively mild. While receiving treatment, his whole family tested positive. Although he was declared free of the virus, after two tests, friends and relatives won't visit or talk to him, even from a distance. The day I, I, I left here to go for you know, to Wilkins, that's when my wife and my children were tested and the results that's when they the results came and they were told they were positive so the doctors called to call for informed me uh, oh yes at first i was very worried why the whole family is affected so we agreed that i must come back home the World Health Organization has warned that stigmatization could contribute to more severe health problems and difficulties controlling infectious diseases during an epidemic. This is because it can drive people to hide the illness to avoid discrimination. It can also prevent them from adopting healthy behaviors. Chom Hono, CGTN. For Muslims fasting during the 30-day Ramadan period, iftar is a meal served and eaten after sunset to break the daytime fast. Typically, these meals are enjoyed in a group gathering among family and friends with some going out to eat. However, with the outbreak in Tanzania, this tradition has had to change to incorporate social distancing measures. For instance, I have bought disposable plates and disposable cups. In terms of the seating arrangement, I have had to encourage my customers to sit apart from each other because my customers usually like sitting together. But because of this problem, I have had to really encourage them to sit apart. Some people don't understand the concept of one meter apart, and neither do they understand its effects if they don't adhere to it. They believe that religion would want them to sit together as it was in the past. But because of the effects of the coronavirus, even religion has had to be accommodative in order to avoid harm. In the U.S., a memo advising Republican candidates running for office has been obtained by American news outlet Politico. It's being reported that the document urges candidates to blame China over the coronavirus. CGTN's Timothy Ulrich has the story. It was a strategy exclusive to the GOP's top lawmakers. It comes from China. That's why it comes from China. But a new report published Friday details how Republican candidates in this year's elections are being recommended to attack China. The memo was released by a committee working to elect Republican senators. It was authored by Brett O'Donnell, one of the party's top strategists. China's foreign ministry spokesperson Hua Chuanying tweeted about the political report, what a playbook. Included in the memo, calling on candidates to push the talking point that the virus is China's fault. The Democratic Party is soft on China, and the Chinese Communist Party is our enemy. Similar narratives have already emerged, with the Trump campaign attacking his rival Joe Biden in a similar fashion. An ad released by the campaign earlier this month claimed Biden has cozy ties with China. And as other races begin to heat up across the country, the blame game appears to be as well. Timothy Ulrich, CGTN. It's time now for us to take a short break and return more news. We'll see you. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo, who come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. 
along the waters of the Nile, along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Were you worried about your life at that no. particular time? Not at all. What is your assessment of the state of the continent today? Africa has the potential to pie itself. Excuse me. <laughs> How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Well, as part of our extensive coverage of COVID-19, starting today, we will have a dedicated series on how African countries are dealing with the coronavirus. We start by looking at how the pandemic has affected the health sector and what the response across the continent has been. The World Health Organization has warned that countries with weaker health systems that have historically struggled to contain infectious disease outbreaks, many of which are in Africa, could be hit hard by the spread of COVID-19. Public health care systems across the continent are often described as fragile, with limited health care spending and personnel. Private sector players barely fill the gap. CGTN's Raman Yang explores how African governments got to this point. Now, as is the case with many other things, this mostly comes down to how willing or not, as you're about to see, governments are to properly fund public health care systems. So let's start at the very top. You see, at the very start of the century, African governments agreed to spend no less than 15% of the national budget on health care by 2015. But by 2014, only four countries had either met or exceeded that spending target. 18 others were somewhere middling around 10 to 15 percent. Now, to be clear, it wasn't that total healthcare spending had fallen. It's just that that particular target had not been met. So take Kenya, for example. Between 2014-2015, when the Abuja Declaration should actually have been met, and last June, total spending on healthcare more than doubled. It went from $1 billion to $2 billion. But even at these levels, it's still woefully insufficient. As a percentage of total government spending, healthcare was about 5.7% on average across this entire period. At the same time, though, the question is, okay, so where's the money going, right? In the last two fiscal years, Kenya has spent four times as much on servicing debt, both foreign and domestic, compared to its public healthcare system. And it isn't alone. In this respect, in 2017, Ghana spent five times more on debt service than it did on healthcare. Nigeria spent three times as much, according to Bloomberg data. So clearly, because of government spending priorities, there's simply no fiscal room to build out a functional, efficient public healthcare 
system. And this also explains why the calls for debt relief are coming up in the case of this crisis. All right, then, so that's where the public money is going. But when governments can't or, as you've seen, choose not to spend properly on public health systems, the cost burden then falls on African citizens. According to the WHO, out-of-pocket payments more than doubled between 1995 and 2014 from about $15 per capita all the way to 38. At least 60% of healthcare costs are paid directly by citizens from their limited income, and it often comes at a very steep cost. According to the WHO, 11 million Africans fall into poverty every year just because of medical costs. Some countries have tried to set up national health insurance programs of one kind or another, but coverage is often patchy at best. Nigeria, for example, set up a national health insurance scheme in 1999. Operations only started in 2005, and by end 2016, barely 4% of the population had actually subscribed to it, and participation isn't mandatory. In Kenya, a comparable system covered roughly 18% of the population in 2015. And South Africa, home to the continent's most advanced capital markets, it only started its national health insurance scheme in 2012, and it's got a 14-year rollout as well. Private medical insurance plans as a comparable proxy cover roughly 16% of the population. So if you put all of these factors together, the poor and often wasted funding levels, the massive lack of coverage for a significant chunk of the population, the scarce infrastructure and equipment, and of course a shortage as well of trained medical personnel. And it's clear why many African countries are simply not prepared for a pandemic on this scale. Back to you. Meanwhile, some African countries are leveraging their capacity to test for COVID-19 as one of the ways of investing in their health systems. CGTN's Daniel Arab Moy visited a football stadium turned into a temporary hospital some 40 kilometers east of the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. It has been set up as part of measures to fight COVID-19. Frontline healthcare workers and officials in Kenya's Machakos County are turning the local stadium into an isolation facility. Doctors and nurses assemble ventilators and other equipment in readiness for the worst, a possible sharp rise in confirmed COVID-19 admissions. The Stadia facility and the other 122 bed facilities in our various facilities is going to help us to curb the virus. So we are just planning ahead. So far we don't have a case, but we don't know what will happen tomorrow. This makeshift facility hurriedly assembled to deal with the dire situation. If we see numbers are increasing, we'll be able to set up uh, five more tents within that stadium to increase the number to from 60 to 300 beds. It's doable and um, we, it, it, is a, it is a quicker and cheaper way of uh, rather than setting up a whole uh, hospital or dis, uh, destabilizing an hospital to make it a COVID-19 exclusive. We've had uh, several uh, leaders coming up with structures in order to curve or to prepare itself for the coronavirus victims. We want to, the only thing we can do as residents is to support the initiative. At the main hospital in Machakos, an oxygen supply system has been set up for those who might experience shortness of breath. The goal is to continue its usual services under unusual circumstances. Coronavirus has put an immense strain on Africa's healthcare systems, prompting governments to build new makeshift hospitals and testing facilities to help contain the spread of the virus. The pandemic has sent countries scrambling to ramp up testing efforts while maintaining bed space for other patients in their hospitals. With the battle to contain the virus still raging, the frontline caregivers are just not about to give up, sacrificing their time, setting aside their normal lives to attend to those in dire need of medical attention. With the overwhelming healthcare challenges, African countries may need to reconsider bolstering their healthcare systems to cope with the rising infections. Daniel Arabmoy, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Meanwhile, South Africa is adjusting to a new reality amid, amid the coronavirus lockdown. While some are adapting to the measures, those suffering from mental illnesses are facing more challenges in doing so. There are fears that cases of depression and other psychological conditions could rise in that country. CGTN's Julie Shire reports. 
The streets of South Africa are quiet except for a few cars and people. The hustle and bustle has been replaced by an eerie silence and fears over COVID-19 isolation and financial commitments. It feels worse for those suffering with anxiety and depression. There is a very real sense of loss. There's a loss of freedom, but there's also a loss of income and then that loss of personal connection, especially for people who stay absolutely on their own. I don't think anyone could have been prepared for this. It doesn't matter even if you knew about it ahead of time. Anxiety is coming up quite a lot. So many different profiles of people. More trickier of a profile is the mere fact that all the elements of the lockdown is really supporting the depression to actually get worse. Um, and also because people that are depressed are less uh, likely to be vocal. Several interventions have been put into place by government for financial assistance. Banks have issued debt payment holidays, but for some it feels too much to bear. I'm worried about the end of this month, how I'm going to pay medical aid, car, house, um, what, are, you know, how, what are my kids going to do if, if my income stops? So it's very stressful. Being confined at home is traumatic for most, but there are many online platforms now offering support. Social workers are also encouraging people to stay in touch with their clinicians if they're not coping. It may be important to kind of just have a quick call with your provider and say, you know, I'm not sure if this is uh, seeing me through or holding me at this particular point in time because we're in a more stressful environment right now. For us to be in isolation is completely counter to our nature. So if you have the resilience, if you have the, 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 the emotional wherewithal, reach out to people that you know need some help, especially the elderly. There's nothing at the moment that anyone can do to make the situation go away. But we can, as humans, use the technology to connect to people. At least 16% of South Africans suffer from some kind of mental illness, and the mental health of the general population is likely to worsen as the lockdown progresses. Many are also coming to the realization that life may never return to normal. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. A significant number of highly skilled medical professionals from Africa are heading overseas, even as the continent battles the COVID-19 pandemic. They're mainly relocating to the West and other regions in search of better opportunities. The World Health Organization has warned that their exit poses a serious challenge to the health sectors in their respective home countries. CGTN's Kelechi Emekelam brings us that report. A growing number of doctors, nurses and paramedics from Africa are making their way to Europe, America and other parts of the world. In Nigeria, for instance, the Medical Association reports that no less than 700 health workers leave the country annually for better pay. Nigerian doctors earn between $800 and $2,000 monthly while their counterparts in the U.S. could earn between $6,000 and $30,000 monthly. Their exit is putting a strain on the nation's health sector. You have less doctors to cater for a large population of people. You know, so um, for you to understand that properly, you could just go to an outpatient, any outpatient department in any government institution and see the crowds that are waiting to see a single doctor in a day, you know, and you don't expect, you don't expect the best out of, out of that doctor, you know, that is constantly overstretched. We have a, we have a very poor patient to doctor ratio, you know, based on WHO uh, recommendations, and that doesn't give for effective healthcare delivery to the citizens. More and more universities churn out student doctors every year, it takes about six years and thousands of dollars to train a medical doctor in Nigeria. 88% of them consider work opportunities outside the country. And that's mainly because they're exposed to poor working conditions exacerbated by deteriorating hospital facilities. The working conditions for health care professionals in this country are quite deplorable. Um, the pay, 
uh, equipment and facilities to manage, uh, to diagnose patients and manage them effectively are generally lacking in most health institutions across the country. Um, this in itself is enough for one after a lot of years of rigorous training um, to seek greener pastures elsewhere. Um, it's not just seeking greener pastures, but the job satisfaction also um, is generally lacking um, in Nigeria. The WHO worries that Africa is ill-equipped to respond to the coronavirus pandemic. Not far from the truth for a country like Nigeria with a ratio of 6,000 people to one doctor. A situation, experts say, calls for a state of emergency. They suggest government should pay more attention to equipping hospitals to world standards, increasing budget reallocations for the health sector and improving welfare packages for professionals. Kilichi Amekalam, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. That's it for our special coverage of COVID-19 in Africa tonight. Tomorrow, we'll look at the impact the pandemic is having on the environment. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the last Ebola patient has been discharged from a hospital in Beni. The seven-year-old girl was discharged on Sunday from the treatment center where she had been admitted since April the 13th. According to the World Health Organization, there have been no new confirmed cases of Ebola for the past seven days. However, authorities are searching for another patient who recently escaped the treatment center, which caused concern over the delay to end the outbreak. Are we starting to count today? No. We're going to start counting the 42 days from the time we find our escapee, the one that got away from the response teams. So if he's in hiding and he's listening to us, we are asking him to help the community, to help the sick and to help all the people in contact around this patient so that we can take care of him. Burundi's political parties have started campaigning for next month's presidential elections. This despite the global coronavirus pandemic. Authorities are pressing on with the May 20th vote for a successor to President Pierre Nkurunziza. The former rebel leader has been in power since 2005. He ran for a third term in 2015, triggering violent protests and a failed coup in the African nation. Well, let's now hand over to Uche for the latest in business news. Thank you, Hannah. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Biz today. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce proposes a tariff-free trade deal with Kenya. And Egypt's central bank eases restrictions on cash withdrawals. Africa is the nexus of enterprise. And global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects just in terms of revenues from taxes alone $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on global business weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Now, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has advised its state government to work on a comprehensive trade agreement with Kenya that is against a proposed phased approach to the deal. Back in February, President Donald Trump and his Kenyan counterpart, Uhuru Kenyatta, announced plans of a new trade deal that will come in force after the lapse of a Goa. The Chamber's U.S. Africa Business Center has said a high, have said a high standard agreement that eliminates all tariffs will boost the long-term economic outlook 
for both countries. Now, this will further position Kenya as a model for economic reform across Africa. Two-way goods trade between the United States and Kenya totaled $1.1 billion in 2019. That's up 4.9 percent from 2018. The trade talks would be the first U.S. bilateral trade deal with a sub-Saharan African nation. Meanwhile, Kenya continues to record more remittances from its citizens working or living in the United States of America, the UK, as well as the rest of Europe. Weekly data from the Central Bank of Kenya shows that remittance inflows increased to $228.9 million in March 2020, and that's compared to $218.8 million in February. Now, the cumulative inflows in the 12 months to March 2020 totaled about $2.8 $83 billion compared to $2.72 billion in the same 12 months to March 2019. That's reflecting a growth of 4.3%. Available figures puts total diaspora remittances to Kenya in 2019 at $2.54 billion compared with $2.45 billion the previous year. Now, the increase is despite effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the global economy, which of course has cut such inflows from other countries countries such as South Africa, United Arab Emirates, as well as Mauritius and Oman. Now, Kenya's Health Cabinet Secretary Mutahi Kagwe has announced additional measures allowing operations of restaurants during the coronavirus pandemic. Restaurants will be open between 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Owners of eateries will, however, be required to get their staff tested for COVID-19 and, and, and can open their businesses once their employees have tested negative. The Cabinet Secretary urged that social distancing must also be maintained by staff while in the kitchens. The new regulations come as the East African nation reports an additional eight new COVID-19 cases. This raises Kenya's tally of cases to 363. However, eight people have been discharged from isolation facilities, bringing the number of total recoveries to 114. Well, let's head to Egypt now. The country's central bank has raised the limit of cash that people are allowed to withdraw. The move comes out almost a month after the government's limited withdrawals by individuals and companies. Now, the decision comes at a time when Egyptians are spending more as the holy month of Ramadan begins. CGTN's Adel El Marui has that story. Egyptian banks officially operate for fewer hours during Ramadan. That leaves more customers seeking other banking services outside the holds. With a cash withdrawal restriction placed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the situation could have been worse if the limit was not lifted. But the Central Bank of Egypt has decided to increase the cash limits to lift pressure off banks. With the COVID-19 circumstances in mind, the government wants to see a gradual approach to normal life. Ramadan has different scenarios. People's consumption increase, their spending increases, many engage in charity work and donations. That is the core reason for the central bank's shift in policy. Holders of personal accounts are allowed up to 3,200 US dollars daily cash withdrawal, up from the $630 limit that was in place. ATMs are now allowing withdrawals of up from 320. The same limits apply to daily deposits as well. The limits on deposits is not reasonable. It was implemented suddenly. It caused panic among Egyptians. Most of them are not ready to use electronic banking. The digital infrastructure in most banks remains weak. Online wires from one bank to the other could take up to one week. Since Egypt reported COVID-19 cases, the country's central bank says it's been worried about transmission of the virus through banknotes. It has been trying to urge the public to use cashless payments. Even though it has restricted cash withdrawals, the bank has not imposed any limits on bank wires or for corporate accounts. Increasing the cash withdrawal limits for Egyptians during Ramadan is a great relief. Public spending nearly triples during that holy month. Adel Mahoui, CGTN, Cairo. Well, let's turn our attention now to the aviation sector. Qatar Airways has deferred payment of 50% of salaries 
for its mid-level and senior staff in Doha for about three months with effect from April 2020. Now, according to the airline, employees across all job levels, including overseas employees and junior employees, have taken voluntary sal salary deferrals in solidarity with their colleagues. The deferment comes after airline ar airlines around the world have been grounded in order to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Despite the suspension of international passenger flights, Qatar Airways cargo business has increased operations in order to ensure the continuity of global trade and movement of essential medical and aid supplies with almost 100 flights per day. And Rwanda Air will also cut the salaries of its lowest paid employees by 8% and by 65% for its top earners. Now, the carrier, which flies a fleet of 12 Boeing and Airbus planes to 29 destinations across three continents, has been one of the rising stars in Africa. Back in February, Qatar Airways said it was in talks to buy a 49% stake in the airline. Air Mauritius said this week that it has entered voluntary administration due to the crisis. It's joining Virgin Australia and South Africa Airways, who have called on administrators. And shifting focus now, the world's largest flower producer is going through a dramatic slump in sales. And this is in turn forcing growers in the Netherlands to destroy their stocks. Here's CGTN's Stefan de Vries with more. This is Sandra Munster. With her husband, she produces 12 million bulbs and flowers a year. April and May are usually the busiest months. But this spring, 80% of all flowers have been destroyed. It's big impact in our business, uh, first of all because of the, the price of the cut flowers. It went down uh, hugely uh, mid-March, uh, all export went down, so that is a big problem. Next to that, uh, I do guided tours in my uh, greenhouses and in the tulip fields, and uh, tourism is uh, zero. In this moment, uh, we think the loss is about uh, 450,000 euros in our company. The Netherlands is the largest flower producer of the world. More than half of all the flowers sold come from these massive and colorful fields in the west and the north of the country. But since the coronavirus outbreak, flower shops around the world have closed and sales have plummeted. It happened with one blow. Uh, so uh, within one or two days, there was no demand for flowers anymore. Ja Bond has negotiated an important aid package from the Dutch government. There's 600 million euros in it. Uh, and now we have to, um, um, yeah, to make sure that, that, that companies who are healthy, uh, they don't go broke. Now these iconic flowers are silent witnesses of the corona crisis. The growers in this region are still optimistic, but they also know that if the crisis lasts much longer, their future will be increasingly uncertain. Stefan de Vries, Slotdorp in the Netherlands, CGTN. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz. But coming up ahead on Global Business Africa, staff at Cash Strapped South African Airways to get more time to negotiate a severance package. We'll bring you more on that top of the hour. For now, it's back to you, Anne. Thank you, Uche. Well, let's take a short break and return more news. Do stay with us. Join us in Global Business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir allowed the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. This year, South Africans had to commemorate Freedom Day under a lockdown. 
being a public holiday, it's usually a time most South Africans get together with family and friends over delicious homemade meals that often include the country's beloved brides, which are various meats roasted on an open fire. While lockdown this year meant that families could not enjoy time together this Freedom Day, a group of musicians urged the country to beat the blues as they shared an upbeat version of South Africa's national anthem, Nkosi Sikilele. Here's CUCS Julie Shire with that story. South Africa's best guitarists have come up with a rocking version of the national anthem to lift the mood on Freedom Day. 26 years ago, South Africa went to the polls to cement their democracy. But there will be no celebrations this year amid the COVID-19 lockdown. To the original, which was composed um, in uh, 1897 by Enoch Sondonga, and it was composed as a prayer for Africa and not necessarily as a national anthem, but of course, South Africa adopted it. And, and for us, that was also important to go back to the essence of the way that song was written as a prayer for Africa and a prayer for unity in the continent. The frontline workers, everybody's really working hard, taking high risks to keep us safe. So whatever we as artists and all musicians can do to help spread goodwill at a moment of its inspiration and, and positiveness to the nation that will help us get through it. Artists lend an important voice in times of despair. South Africa's inequality levels have been laid bare during the COVID-19 crisis. Freedom Day brings a chance to take stock of the country's progress. I do not have a complete sense and confidence that we have achieved uh, what that uh, mission began with in 1994. And I think this whole uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 situation has exposed the holes in the system, not just in South Africa, but internationally. This situation is forcing us to accept that we should provide health care for everybody, regardless of class or whether they have money or not. I believe that thoughts become things, you know, and therefore, you know, if, if we all think and hopefully feel and believe that good things can and will happen, you know, we can all change the world in our own way. This year's Freedom Day will be solemn compared to many that have preceded it. South Africa mourns dozens who have fallen to COVID-19 and the country will need to dig deep to continue fighting. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. We're going to take a short break and return your sports news, including... South African players reflect on inaugural FIFA E-Nation Stay and Play Cup. How would you create your legend? On the fields, on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, fine. Africa Live. Find your voice. It's time now for your sport news. South Africa took valuable lessons out of the inaugural FIFA E Nation Stay and Play Cup. The team featuring cricketers Kakiso Rabada and Andile Pelukwayo Bafana 4-0. 